Testing. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, before I get started, uh, I'd like to say something first. I want to thank the Hall of Fame and all my fans, because without them, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just want, I always wanted to say this. <laughs> my name is Luis Jimenez Ramirez. I was born in Juarez, Mexico. Yep, I'm a real life Mexican. <laughs> I have uh, five brothers, two sisters, Two of my brothers, as well as both my parents, have already passed on. May God bless them. And my testimony that I'm about to give is also a testament of the love that God has for all of us and how he's always been near. He's always near even before we came to him, certainly in my case. Okay, my father brought the family to California legally because that's where all the work was. Me, my brothers, my father worked out in the fields. And we picked tomato by hand, even cotton by hand, I remember that. We uh, chopped cotton, chopped lettuce with a sadon, a hoe. But the main line of work that we did was moving irrigation lines, or water sprinklers, the kind you see out in the fields. Nowadays, it's automated. They have these big wheels that move the line. But Back in our day, we had to do it manually, and they had to be moved every day. And it was hard at first because we get up, we, we get started before the sun comes up. And, um, and I remember when we finished, we go to an irrigation pump, the water's coming out into like a big old swimming pool made out of dirt. And we get in there and we wash up because we're all muddy. Then we go home. And people are just beginning to get their day started. They're beginning to go to work. Uh, the day's barely beginning, but our work day is over. And that's one of the good things. Our work day was over. We go home. My mother's making breakfast. And the whole house would smell like tortillas de harina, flour tortillas. It could, well, nowadays, you, know, you can go to the store and buy a pack of flour tortillas. But back then, you had to make them from scratch. And it was great. She'll be making breakfast, the radio will be playing Mexican music. And that's a, a fond memory I always have of that time. And my father, he was strict when it came to work. He didn't put up with any fooling around. And when he said, Levantese, vámonos, that means get up, let's go. You better get up. And Sometimes I'd be awake and I can hear him coming down the hallway and I knew in a couple of seconds he's going to turn on the switch and let's go. But it was hard, but when you're working with your brothers out there, it's not too bad. And my father was like a lot of fathers, even fathers of today. It was hard for him to show emotion. I mean, I know he loved us, he loved me, but he just couldn't never bring himself to say, um, I'm proud of you, son. Well done, son. I love you, son. He just couldn't say that. But when we messed up or did something wrong, oh, he had no trouble expressing himself. <laughs> I mean, he called me idiot, stupid, good for nothing. And sometimes over little things, minor stuff, something I never didn't quite understand. And when I was in in grade school, second grade, third grade, I was an extrovert. I would tell stories to my friends, and they loved hearing them. I would make them up, sometimes right on the spot, because I had a good imagination. And I'd draw pictures for them, and they loved that, and that made me happy. And as I got older, my, my father's verbal abuse got worse. And you know, when, you're, when your father continually calls you, you know, worthless, you, you start to believe it. But I want to make something clear right now. My father was not a monster. He wasn't. He was a hard worker. He was a hard working man. He worked hard every day to provide for us. 
he uh, just didn't realize the effect his words were having on me and my youngest brother, especially me. And by the time I got to high school, I was withdrawn, I was quiet, nervous. And that's the age where you're, you become self-conscious of your appearance, how you stack up among your classmates, and you, think you start noticing girls. And my, my self-esteem was, was shattered. My self-confidence was almost non-existent. And to describe my four years in high school, I was basically like a shadow on the wall. I was there, and I wasn't there. So, after I graduated, I think a year after I graduated, I enlisted in the Army, the United States Army, for a couple of reasons. One was to be on my own, be away from home for the first time, and see if I had what it takes. And the other one, of course, was to get away from my father, which is kind of sad, you know, to get away from that situation. And while I was in the Army, uh, I met a lot of born-again Christians. Well, they approached me. We call them Jesus freaks back then. I'm a Jesus freak now. And back then, that's what we called them. And they approached me. They talked to me about Jesus, about God, and how he has love for everybody. But I was in a, in a state of mind to listen, not at that time. And they couldn't answer my questions because I thought I was being clever. I asked these clever questions. And just not really to listen to what they had to say. And in all fairness to them, I was just being stubborn. But the Army was a good experience. It was a good learning experience for me. And more about my religious background, I was raised as a Catholic. Um, we lived in Cantua Creek, and these ladies from Tranquility, which is like 20, min 20 miles away from Cantua Creek, every Sunday, they drive down and pick us up, and I go to church. I mean, they, they were sweet. We'd go to church, and I even went to Sunday school where we had lessons. I made my first communion in, in the church of Mendota, all that Catholic stuff. But none of that sunk in. I mean, it didn't. I mean, I liked the singing and all that at the church, but none of it sunk in. I didn't learn anything, really. I knew who Jesus was. He died on the cross. The main thing I remember about those days was, was the food. <laughs> you, they always had food, and that was great. Um, so, when I got out of the Army, I was discharged honorably, and, and I went back and lived with my parents for around a year. And then came that day. The day, uh, I mean, nothing had changed as far as my father was concerned. He was still you know, saying these things. And I remember we had a, a big confrontation. And I asked him, you know, Dad, you know, Father, why are you still talking to me like that? And, you know, I'm an adult now. Why are you still saying those things? He, he didn't say anything. And, you know, when your own father is ashamed of you, that's what I felt. You know, what's the use? And I don't know where, at that time we were living in Three Rocks. It's a small town close to the foothills. It's named after those three rocks that you see. I don't know why. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not even a town. There's more dogs than people. But uh, that's what we were living at the time. And there's this road in the back of Three Rocks that goes up to the foothills. I mean, the mountains are right there. And I don't know where I got that capsule, those containers you get at drugstores that fill your prescription. This one had 30 or 40 sleeping pills. I mean, I already, I, I already knew what I wanted to do, which is stupid. But, you know, it's just, I reached that point. Now the road, Going to the mountains, uh, me and my brothers, many times, and friends, we would go down the road and we'd look at the mountains and, oh, let's go to that area. We see a big old rock. And it looks like it's a simple climb. You, know, you go up there, no problem. No, it's deceiving. There's a lot of valleys and gullies in between. So it takes a while to get up there. Then it takes a while to get back down. So we always go in the morning, that we have plenty of time, spend the day at the mountains, 
then go back home. On that day, when I went to the mountains on my, by myself, the, the sun was already hanging low. But it didn't matter to me because I already knew what I was going to do. And so I went and I climbed up. By the time I got to the area I wanted to get to, the sun was really going down. And I remember I stood there and I looked back out in the distance and I swallowed the pills. I took them all. And then I, I, I realized, hey, hey, Lewis, there's no turning back now. The pills are inside me. You know what? I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared at all. I was calm. There was like a peace that came over me. And it was probably because I'm not going to have to face those, anything anymore. And yeah, it was stupid of me. But I took the pills and I cleared a little area. And I, I laid down, closed my eyes, and waited to go to sleep. Around 20 minutes later, 20, 15 minutes, my stomach, it felt bad, boy. It felt like somebody kicked me in the stomach. Oh, and bam, all those pills came right back out. And I threw them up, and I was on my hands and knees, and it was really dark now. And I remember I was right there on my hands and knees, and I looked up, and oh man, the, the sky was beautiful, the stars were magnificent, because up there there's no light pollution, it's all dark, and the stars were just beautiful like diamonds, and they seem so close. Like if I went with my arm like that, I would disperse them. I always remember that, man, beautiful. And that's the first time I, I talked to God. I looked up and I asked him, God, are you trying to tell me something? Do you have plans for me? And I, was, I stood there and I knew I gotta go home, I gotta go back home. And it was dark. I mean, I had, I remember putting my hand, like, you know, right this close, and I couldn't see my hand. Everything was all dark. The only thing I could see were the lights of the town and the stars, and I used them as a guide to get, start going down off the mountain. So I, I started walking down, and there's a lot of snake holes up there, a lot of snake holes and gullies and valleys, but I, you can't see nothing. And there's all these bushes, dried up bushes with thorns, and I, I fall down and I get all scratched up. And I was thinking, oh, man, this, I, I messed up, you know. It's going to take a while here. And then later, a little bit later, I could hear noises all around me. And, and I, it sounded like dogs, all excited. But I, it wasn't dogs. I knew what it was. It was coyotes because there's a lot of coyotes in that area. We used to see them when we worked out in the field. We used to see coyotes cross the road with a rabbit in their, in their mouth. So I knew what it was, coyotes. And they were all excited, whimpering and everything. And to them, it was like, all right, and, you know, dinner time. And I'm thinking, man, this is a bad situation here. And I thought to myself, Lewis, whatever you do, don't fall. And as soon as I thought that, I stepped on something, boom, down I went. And in that darkness, in that darkness, my right hand landed on this piece of wood, like a beam. I mean, I didn't see no wood when I went up there, but my hand landed on this piece of wood. And I got up on my knees and started swinging it and yelling as loud as I could. And, and I stood up and kept swinging it. I hit two of them. I remember, bam. And I went this way. I hit another one. I hit him so hard, it almost knocked the... the stick out of my hand, like, whoa. And man, but if it wasn't with that stick, so I kept going down the mountain, stumbling, kept falling, but I had that stick, I kept swinging it and yelling until finally they left me alone. And I got down to the road and I just threw that stick into a field and I ran all the way home. And I didn't tell anybody what, what I did or where it was. A couple of days after that, I went back to, to look for that stick. And I knew where the, the field, even though it was dark, I knew where I threw it because we moved lines everywhere. And this field where I threw it, it wasn't, there was no crop, it was just a disc. So it'd be easy to find, but it wasn't there. I, I never found it. Anyway, it wasn't long after that, 
that I, I moved out. I started working at Spreckless Sugar Factory. I don't know if you guys remember a factory right by Mendota, made sugar out of sugar beets. I worked there. It's still there, but it doesn't make sugar beets anymore. Somebody took it over. But that's where I was working. And, and um, I'm trying to find a place. <laughs> oh, OK. And another thing I remember when I was in the Army, I started to learn how to play guitar. And I bought my first guitar right before I joined the Army. Because I love music, I always loved music, and I just didn't want to listen to it. I wanted to be part of it. So to be part of it, you know, play an instrument, whatever, and I picked a guitar. And then in the Army, I, I was learning how to play guitar. If I do have any talent, it's that I learn quickly. I pick up things real quickly. And I, before, it wasn't long before I was writing songs. And we get have get-togethers at friends' house, and they say, Louis, pull out the guitar and play a Beatles song, whatever. And we would, I would. And there was other soldiers, other friends that I made that played guitar, and we have jam sessions, and that was awesome. That was great. I, I told one of my friends that, man, when I get out of the Army, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to be in a band. I'm going to join a band, or I'm going to form my own band. And that's what I did. I formed my own band. And there was three of us, and we call ourselves La Mosca, the fly, <laughs> with two eyes. I thought that was pretty cool, you know. And we played parties, barbecues. We played a quinceanera. A quinceanera is a Mexican tradition where a girl turns 15. And it's like a coming out party. She's a young lady now, presenting her to the world. And it's quinceanera. And we played that. We ruined it. But <laughs> we'll play it. I mean, poor girl. I always regret that. We're playing Van Halen and all that stuff. <laughs> Um, but, and then I knew that, uh, and we were getting pretty good, we were getting pretty good, but I knew we needed a lead guitarist because I, I can't play lead that good, I can play rhythm, but if we had a lead guitarist, that would really make the band even stronger, and we found one in Fresno. He joined, and through his connections, because he played with a lot of bands, we started playing clubs here in Fresno, and the, the, the popular clubs, and we were getting a reputation as a good live band. We, we were on the, the radio, KFSR. <laughs> you send in the tape and if they like it, they play it. And we were on cable TV when cable was first coming in. And we recorded the CD at a, in a studio. And um, uh, it, it was great. We even had a following. We began to get a following. People really liked us. And, if I can use another phrase, I was living, living the lifestyle of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I did a lot of drugs. We all did. The main drugs we did was cocaine and marijuana. And the 80s and the 90s were like a blur. It was just one party after another. Some party would last like a couple of days, a couple of nights, nonstop. It was getting out of hand, really, um, because people like hanging out with us. After we do a gig, they follow us back to the house, you know, party, or they invite us to their place because they really liked us. And I, I don't know how many times I woke up in somebody else's house, somebody else's apartment, like, oh man, because I spent the night there. And that happened a lot of times. And I remember uh, I woke up uh, again, and I looked around. Oh, man, it all came back to me. Oh. So I called a friend to come pick me up. And while I was waiting, I, I remember uh, there was a Bible on the table. And to kill time, I opened it. And I started reading a little bit and looking at it. But I didn't know what I was looking at or reading. And so like you know, Proverbs, Deuteronomy. Uh, Kings, you know, what is this? But I remember another time, the same thing happened. I was in somebody else's place, and there was a big Bible, a real nice one. It was all decorated, had beautiful illustrations. And I opened that one, and I was in the New Testament. And I started reading a little bit more. 
And I noticed that a lot of the verses were highlighted. And I go, huh. And as I read, I realized that's when Jesus was speaking, his words. And so I, I was reading, and I really liked, I didn't quite understand his parables or the way, or what he said to his disciples. But I, the authoritative in, in what he was saying, you know, that really got me. Then I came to Matthew 11, by chance. Matthew 11, chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye who are weary and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And that went straight to me. It was like... It was like, uh, like Jesus himself was talking to me because all those years that I endured the verbal abuse of my father uh, left mental scars, which I still have today. I mean, at work, if I do something wrong, no biggie, right? But for a couple of seconds, this dread comes over me because I knew I was going to get it from my father. It, it doesn't last, but you know, why, you know, why do I have this feeling? It's because I was so used to my father coming down hard for the littlest thing. And I also have a form of social anxiety uh, disorder. It's for, for me to be up here right now. That's <laughs> and that, that condition was nurtured in the environment that I grew up in. And, and I was mentally and physically exhausted. And God knew I was tired. And that verse just spoke to me. But yes, because uh, I had a lot of friends who cared for me and, and loved me. The band was doing great. We were getting ready to play in San Francisco. This band that saw us, they really liked us and they wanted us to open up for them in San Francisco. That would have been a big step. But despite all that, at the end of the day, I always had this empty, hollow feeling like, you know, there's definitely something missing. I didn't know it at the time, but you know, it, it just didn't work. And after reading that verse, I, I continued reading, I read more what Jesus was saying. And the more I read, the more amazed I was of what he was saying. And it was, I began to think like a lot of people did back in Jesus' time, you know, I must know this man. And that's the way I was thinking. I felt like that. And I knew the best way to find out more about Jesus was to go to church, go, go back to church. And how was I going to do that? Well, I don't know. But uh, during the 90s, I became a, a house painter. And I remember uh, I was, uh, we were painting in some apartments. In the house next to the apartment, there was another painter working on that. His name was Xavier. He was a born-again Christian. And he came up to me and started talking to me. And we hit it off right away because he was an artist, too. He was a good artist. And we started talking and, you know, all right. And then he asked me, you know what, I need a good painter. And he had a lot of work. And he asked me if I'd like to work with him. And I said, yeah, okay. So I joined his painting family, and uh, he would tell me about what Christ has done for in his life. And sometimes we'd be driving to a job in the van, and he'd tell me more, but he wouldn't push it on me. If I asked questions, he'd do his best to answer them for me. And this time, I wasn't asking questions to be clever. No, I, I wanted to know, you know. And he told me how his life was before he met Jesus. A man. He was a gang leader. He was in jail. He sold drugs. Um, just, and I looked at him, man, it's totally different, you know. And now he's, he's happy and all this. And he goes, that's what I need. <laughs> and he invited me to his church to go down to one of his services, and I did. And they were happy to see me. Um, they were glad I was there. And I went to a couple of his services. It was nice. And, but I knew I, I want to get my own church. So I started looking around for churches close to where I live. And 
around that time, I, I started my own business. Uh, Xavier, he showed me how to go about that. I started my own business with, with my friend Eddie, who's also a house painter. And me and him basically started at the same time as house painters. And he, he's a good painter, an excellent spray man. He can make cabinets look really nice, refinished, stained, painted. And so me and him start working together. And uh, Jeff Tani, you remember Jeff Tani? He used to go to this church. He was a cabinet maker. He made cabinets, um, tables, anything out of wood. And he came across some cabinets that me and Eddie made, had done. And he asked the, the owner, who, hey, who did these? And she gave him my phone number. And he got in touch with me and he asked me, hey, could you come down to the shop? You know, I got a lot of projects. I need some good painters and all that. So me and Eddie went down there. And yeah, we ended up doing a lot of job, projects for him. Um, and then he, he told me like a week later that his church, Woodward Park, two ladies were having problems with this art project that they were doing. It was a, a painting that was going to go on stage like a portable wall. It comes in three pieces, and they were having trouble doing the sky or something. And, and Jeff asked me, because he seen my artwork too, he seen that I was an artist, and he asked me if I can help out. And I did. We finished it. And then a couple of weeks later, he asked me if I was willing to do a painting for the next sermon series of this church uh, right here on stage. I have to, I'll have to come down here to do it. And I said, yeah, okay. And he told me what it was going to be about. It was, uh, I still remember it, 40 Days of Love. <laughs> it's like a little brochure. And he wanted, can you do that on, on that wall? You know? And I said, yeah. So I was here working on that. And while I was doing it, I was approached by members from the church. Uh, I met like uh, Vanessa, Jessica from the front office. Uh, Pastor David Carruthers, they all came up, introduced themselves, talked to me. Um, Woody, Jackie, Steve, Jana will come up and talk to me. And Teresa, Teresa Watts, she, was the, she used to be the worship team leader. And one thing I forgot to mention when I was reading that Bible, that real pretty one, was um, the words that Jesus was saying seemed like he never wasted any words. All his words carried weight, and that really impressed me. But towards the end, of, when I was doing the painting, Teresa came up and started talking to me. And those churches that I went looking, I was, when I was looking for the right church for me, I went to like five different churches. And they were all nice. They, they were happy to see me and the music and all that, but I didn't really hear anything that made me, would want to make me to go back. And um, one church, a Catholic, they, they were disappointed that I didn't take my hat off. And I thought, whoa, is, is that a problem? I don't think so God's going to turn me away because I'm going to take my hat off. But that's, now that I am a Christian, I, I know more about Catholics and that, that kind of explains why that happened, but that's, that's another thing. Oh, and, but one thing I noticed of all these churches that I went to, there was this exclusiveness, this sense of exclusiveness where, oh, don't go to that church, stay here with us. Or, no, don't go to that church, come to our church. This and that, and I was thinking, that kind of put me off a little bit like, well, I mean, it's all about Jesus, right? No matter where you are. So on the day I was finishing the painting up here, Teresa, she approached me, and she, and she invited me to come down to this Sunday service. And I thought about it. Then I asked her, if I come, Teresa, can I leave my hat on? If she would have said, we accept you as you are, I, I probably wouldn't have showed up because there's that exclusiveness again, you know, we, us. But she didn't say that. She said, God accepts you as you are. And I said, OK, OK. So I came, and I met more 
members of the church, and uh, it was a great experience. I, I liked it. The, the fellowship, everybody treated me so nice, and I, I felt so welcomed. And I go, yeah, and I, I liked the sermon. I liked uh, Pastor David. And, and that was 2009. And on November 9th of that year, I gave my life to, to God. <laughs> and then on December 5th of the same year, I was baptized. Right there. I was baptized and I became a born again Christian. And, and it's, it's been great ever since. A lot of these people that I mentioned, some of them are not here anymore for, for many reasons uh, their job or family, whatever. But they all played a part in my beginnings, in my walk with my Lord. Um, throughout the years, God has been patient with me. And he, he was always nearby, whether it be a Bible on the table or a, a beam of wood in my hand. He was guiding me. And Jeff Tani, you know, running into him, he was always guiding me. And I, I felt his presence many times. I even wrote songs with why I, I refer to God, you know. And... Jesus made a promise to me. He promised that he would give me rest, peace, and refreshment. And he, he's kept that promise. And, okay. I'm not the same man I was before. And I love my father. I love my father. We became closer towards the end of his life. I love my father like Jesus loves me. And, and when I think back to that day I was in, on the mountain, you know, there I was all alone. It was dark, hungry predators were all around me. And look where I am now. Praise God. Only God can do that. It's, it has been a great honor for me to have been asked to share my testimony with all of you. And I thank you, and God bless. Thank you for sharing that with us. That is a great story of God's faithfulness. So we appreciate you doing that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I know it's hard when you talk about... Uh, I know you don't like... I shouldn't say you don't like... You're not comfortable being up here. But that was really yeah. a blessing to us. So we're, <laughs> no, my, my we appreciate breakfast. it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I just want to take uh, really just a really short time. Just kind of piggyback on what Lewis was saying... Um, just about God's faithfulness. And as he was talking there, um, I was thinking about Romans 10. And at the end there, it says, in Romans 10, 11, it says, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so you have that promise there that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved because there's, you know, there's a separation between God and man because of sin. And you think of just all the things that happen in the world with sin, and there are a lot of things that make us question, like, well, well what, is, what is going on? Is there, is there purpose? And there is, and God is always working. And sometimes we can't answer the question of why things happen um, why did Lewis's dad not understand the words, the, the effect that his words were having? Um, you know, with Carrie's death last week, why does that happen? And 
there oftentimes we can't answer the why, but we can always answer the what next, or what should we be doing next. And ultimately, you know, it, it all comes down to this, that we need to call upon the name of the Lord, first for salvation, and then for comfort through these things. There are oftentimes, even with, you know, speaking with Janet this week, and, um, you know, how do you go through that if you're not a believer? How do you go through losing your husband if you aren't confident that one day you'll see him again in heaven? How do you do that? And, and I don't know the answer to that. And I've, um, and I've, I, I remember sitting with a, we had a neighbor up the street who, whose husband died unexpectedly and going down to her house and they weren't believers and just really being at a loss for what to say. Um, because I'm so used to just talking to believers and saying, hey, you know what, you're going to see him again and pointing them to the truth of the gospel. And it's hard. But what we do know is that God is faithful. And verse 11 there, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. When we put our faith in Christ, there's never a point at which you will find him to be lacking where you will find him not to satisfy, where you will find him not to be enough to where you're ashamed of putting your faith in Christ. God is always faithful. And I love there verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. You know what? There's, there's no difference between people. We all need to be saved. And the only distinction that God makes is those who have put their faith in him and are his children and those that still need to. And if we went around the room and had everybody share their testimony, you're going to find that, you know, it's just a wide range of stories. You know, Louis born in Mexico and, you know, Noel born in the Philippines. I was born in Sacramento and, you know, just all over the place and different yeah, Lewis was in the army. I was never in the military. My dad was in the military. You know, just all these different life stories of, of how they work. But yet God is Lord over everybody. And he is the same God to everybody. And he is faithful. Just, I, that's, the, that's the word I want you to hear this morning is God is faithful. And I love that that's what Lewis finished with. Tells his whole story. And it is amazing to me, like, he's, he's partying and going into houses where parties are happening and finding Bibles. Like, how does that, like, I'm not, I don't think most people are like, hey, let's have a party and do drugs, and by the way, we'll put a Bible on the coffee table. Like, that's not, that's not the normal thing, I, I don't think. Um, but yet, God was faithful in that and just causing Lewis to run into his word. And so, um, you know, that's the word I want you to hear this morning, is God is faithful. And um, if you don't know him, uh, you know, we would love to tell you about him. So, um, Grab somebody, grab me, grab Lewis. Uh, we would love to share the gospel with you, okay? But so hold tight to that. Um, oh, one last verse I want to share with you because it's always, God's word's always better than mine, um, is Hebrews 10. And it, says, it gives us this command, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We hold fast to God, not because of who we are, but because he is faithful. So again, just hold fast to God because he's faithful. Let me pray, and then I think Woody's got a couple announcements, and we'll uh, let you go. God, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us, Lord. God, we thank you so much for uh, letting Lewis share his story with us this morning, God. It is um, just such an amazing story of your grace, Lord, of your goodness, of your faithfulness to him before he even knew who, what it was to have a personal relationship with you, God. And it just reminds me of how you say that you demonstrate your love to us while we were sinners. You died for us, God. And, and you were faithful in your calling, Lord. And so we just, we just praise your name for that, Lord. And God, we ask that you would help us to hold fast to you, Lord, knowing that you are faithful. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.